I'm going to go ahead and do a mic check. Lindsay, can you hear me? Yeah, your mic's working. Perfect, great. So hello, everybody. My name is Yuni Yi, and I am at the University of Michigan. Um, before we go ahead and get started, I want to send a huge thank you and congratulations to the organizer of this series. Um, it's been really amazing to see the culmination of this project over the course of such a short period of time. And I think it's a true testament to our urology community's dedication to education. So thank you again. Um, today I'll be presenting on incontinence after prostate treatment, and this will be very much structured around the guideline. I think for time's sake and for everyone's sanity, I won't be going through every single guideline, but I will be um, highlighting some of the big points that are under each section. So I do not have any relevant disclosures, but the one disclosure I will state is that I almost considered this option, but I decided against it. Now, why are we gonna be talking about incontinence after prostate treatment? Yes, this is a guideline that's near and dear to me, more from a clinical perspective, but also I believe it's important because there is a huge impact that is affecting urologists. For instance, this is covering patients that are with, with providers who do BPH or oncology. And we know with the increase in prostate procedures, such as the prostatectomy, as well as BPH procedures, we are noting that there's a significant uh, emotional stress for the patient, financial burden for the patient, as well as relational stress in society and return to society. And I also appreciate that the guidelines really emphasize the fact that incontinence after prostate treatment is truly an iatrogenic condition. So we as uh, clinicians and physicians, we are responsible for counseling our patients appropriately with the risks, the outcomes, and really helping them guide them through the survivorship process. And I know on the Excel document with the lessons, it talks about incontinence after prostate cancer, but these guidelines are very inclusive. So they are including treatments such as radiation, as well as TERP and multimodal treatment. The guidelines are broken down by these topics and I will be following a case and going through some of these and which is nice because it's in order of really at first presentation up until complications and possible special situations. So here's Harold. He's a 68 year old male with a diagnosis of Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer. And in the pre-treatment guidelines, they're really focusing on risk assessment, counseling, expectations of climax urea, as well as sort of expectations after special situations such as TERP after radiation. So in statement three, clinicians should inform patients undergoing radical prostatectomy that incontinence is expected in the short term and generally improves to near baseline by 12 months after surgery, but may persist and require treatment. This actual graph is available on the guidelines, and you can see that initially that ratio of patients that are continent to patients in the total population is, um, is lowered, but then by the six to nine months, you really do see that plateau, and after 12 months, you see more of a plateau. And this is one of the only recommendations that has a grade A recommendation, and so I thought it was very important to include. And I think this will be important because it plays a role in sort of your treatment timeline. And I think that's important. Here's statement five. So patients undergoing transurethral resection of the prostate after radiation or a prostatectomy after radiation, they should really be informed of the high rate of urinary incontinence that's noted. So for instance, there have been studies that have been noted where uh, incontinence can be up to 70% in patients who have a TERP after radiation and from 20 to 70% in patients who undergo a prostatectomy after radiation. There's a specific study here by Kaffenberger et al. that looked at about 30 patients and looked at the incontinence rates and only 12 or 39% would fall under the definition of zero to one pad per day after surgery. So here's Harold again. So he undergoes a prostatectomy with bilateral nerve sparing. That was just two weeks ago. And right now he's at about four to six diapers a day. So what, we, what can we tell them about the post-prostate treatment? So first I wanna discuss definitions. Uh, PFME stands for pelvic floor muscle exercise and there's PFMT for pelvic floor muscle training. 
the training program that is um, the major difference between the two is really who is guiding it. So with the muscle training, it's practitioner guided with an inclusion of muscle exercises to be done at home, whereas the muscle exercises are self-guided. I think what's important about the PSMT is the fact that they are working on muscle awareness, they are working on tactile feedback, visual feedback, as well as muscle feedback. So in statement six, statement six clinicians should offer pelvic floor muscle exercises in the immediate post-operative period. If performed in that early post-operative period, they found in Cochrane Review can improve time to continence as early as three to six months, but not overall continence at 12 months. I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in these studies, um, mainly in sort of how they're executing the pelvic floor training, whether it's a self-guided program and or practitioner guided, and even in some of their protocols that they are doing, it is varied. And so I think it's very difficult to compare, but they are finding that overall it is improving the time to continence just not the overall continent rate at 12 months. Despite conservative therapy, surgical treatment should be offered at one year post prostate treatment. So one of the common statistics that they will often quote to patients is the fact that maybe at six months, you're having 90% of patients go return to baseline with an additional 4% from that six month to 12 month range. But after 12 months, maybe there's an additional 1% of the population that improves. And you know, it's really important to provide that expectation for patients because they may or may not be that 1% and it's really unlikely. And that's important from a counseling standpoint of surgery, whether or not they want to move forward. So I think the audio may be uh, something that's going in and out. Is the audio a little bit better for everybody? Great. I think I had confirmation there. Thank you so much. So moving along. So after six months of the pelvic floor muscle training, he continues to have severe leakage, which is unchanged for the past two months. So what can we do from an evaluation standpoint? And this is where I'm gonna to start to incorporate some live polls. So please be patient with me. Um, this is the first time we are trying it, but it'll be interesting to see what other institutions are doing. The statement nine, uh, clinicians should evaluate the patients with incontinence after prostate treatment with history, physical exam, and appropriate diagnostic modalities to categorize the type and severity of incontinence and degree of bother. And prior to the surgical intervention, for stress urinary incontinence, it should be confirmed by history physical exam or ancillary testing. I feel like these statements are sort of more obvious statements, but I think it's important for maybe mock oral boards or even the real boards to assess and reassess with a history and physical exam and not uh, minimize their importance. But also I think with statement 11, it's I think an extrapolation of um, the guidelines when they were talking about female stress urinary incontinence, that you do want to be able to identify stress urinary incontinence. And this is where I'm gonna try to do this, so please bear with me. So you should be able to utilize this QR code with your phone. I'm not sure if all Androids work, but I know iPhones, you can just put your camera up to it. The other thing is going to the website and entering this code in. I'll give it a few minutes for people to work on.
a lot of residents are coming from the same institution. So, um, so far we have about 300 respondents and it looks like the tenant standing process is the overarching majority and history comes in a nice second through dynamics and then CAD testing. I swear I didn't put it in that order to guide anybody or misguide them in all of this, but it's very interesting. I wish I could screenshot this. Maybe someone else can do that, but I will try to go back to the slides. So as you mentioned in the guidelines, it's important to categorize the type of incontinence, whether it's stress incontinence, urgency, and mixed. With the history, there are questions you can ask. So they talk about, do you lose at night? Um, because when you're laying down in stress incontinence, they likely will not have a lot of incontinence. You can also talk about, are these stress maneuvers that are causing your incontinence? And from an urgency standpoint, is it very difficult to withhold with a sudden urge? And um, one of the things that they really emphasize is that a confirmation of stress incontinence can be very much obtained from a history and physical alone. It's been seen by some of the poll answers. It was the second most common answer that they utilize in clinic evaluation. So there's a study that was done by Dr. Nitti back in the 1990s, and it's the etiology of post-radical prostatectomy incontinence and its correlation with urodynamics. So at that time, they were really focusing more on post-prostatectomy incontinence. Um, but in 60 consecutive patients, they all underwent urodynamic studies. And they compared subjective and objective findings. And of the 57 men who complained of stress urinary incontinence, 54 demonstrated intrinsic sphincter deficiency on urodynamics, which gives it a positive predictive value of about 95%. And of the three men who did not complain of stress urinary incontinence, none demonstrated stress urinary incontinence on urodynamics. Yes, this is a small study, but I think that makes it a very interesting point. And, you know, as you can see from the poll, many people are doing history and physical exam alone. And then it talks about really the severity and degree of father of incontinence. So um, some people may do that via 24 hour pad testing. They have validated one hour pad testing. It can be done by history in the types of pads that they're utilizing, whether it's liners, guards, depends, or thin pads or security pads. And so everyone has their way of marking and grading the degree of father incontinence, but it is important because that will affect their surgery counseling. And then the next thing is the status of their prostate cancer. For patients who may undergo adjuvant radiation, counseling may differ, and also sort of what type of um, procedure that they may undergo that will then affect their outcomes in the future. In statement 12, patients with incontinence after prostate treatment should be informed of management options for their incontinence, and that includes both surgical and non-surgical options. I think what's nice about this particular guideline is that they focus on the non-surgical aspects, first being pads. So um, I think what's important about the pads is understanding the financial burden of a patient. Um, so when I go to like Target or Kroger, I do sometimes pass by this aisle and just kind of take a peek at how much it actually costs. It is really quite expensive and most of our patients are wearing the large and X large. So they're a little more than the dollar eight per count. And you can imagine that if they're even wearing two briefs in a day, that's a little over $60 that they're having to spend. Um, and, you know, that can be quite a financial burden on the patient. And one other interesting thing I highlighted was the fact that on Amazon, you can click whether or not it's new, but I hope they are all new. So going back to the non-surgical devices, they talk about compressive devices, um, namely the Cunningham clamp. Important things for counseling patients on the Cunningham clamp is the fact that um, you really don't want to use it more than two hours at a time. The other thing is they should not be using it overnight. And most definitely you do not want to use this on someone who has impaired sensitivity because they can really hurt themselves. And so the risk of the device is um, higher than the actual benefits. And lastly, they talk about catheters, namely condom catheters. Um, but as everyone knows or may have known if they've ever done a fitting for somebody in clinic, this is very highly dependent on anatomy. Um, and not a lot of our patients can um, 
actually use a condom catheter secondary to their anatomy. And so that might be a limitation. I put indwelling catheter there, but I see that more of a last resort. So in patients who have significant skin excoriation, skin rash, infection, and with severe incontinence, that might be an option to consider. As for the surgical options, we'll talk about them just a little bit later, but they are there as you know. Statement 13, in patients with incontinence after prostate treatment, physicians should discuss risk, benefits, and expectations of different treatments using the shared decision-making model. Whenever they say shared decision-making model, I always think that there's a lot of aspects to that that we are not aware of. And I always um, wonder what is it that everyone's including? In addition, when I became an attending, this was one of the hardest things, especially for the fact that I do a lot of elective procedures. So I do IPPs, slings, and urethral strictures, not so much, but there are these um, procedures that are elective in nature. And I do have to go through this shared decision-making process, which I would say was a lot harder than I think I was expecting. But I did want to do a quick poll, and this one is more of a word cloud. So, This will be set up in the same way. So QR code as well as um, going to the website. Honesty is the first one. I love it. It's very eerie to not hear any sounds, but see a lot of these changes on the screen. So expectations, I love it because that's a lot um, of what I'm saying in this talk is about setting expectations for your patient. Honesty still seems to be a, a big one. Goals, listening, priorities, your own surgical experience. That's a question I get a lot. And that's really tough as a newer attending to really be able to talk with these patients about patient preference statistics, risks and benefits. These are all really good answers. And in the guidelines, they will talk about the fact that shared decision-making is predicated on two important details, which is one, the patient is interested, they are asking the questions, they are involved in the process, and they express their opinions. Secondarily, it's up to the physician to really take those opinions, take those considerations, and guide them to what you feel is the right benefit. So I really do appreciate everyone's um, participation in this. This is really helpful. There probably is some easier way that I can switch to the different screens and I'm sure someone out there is doing it, telling me that I should do it differently, but this is my system right now. Okay, so statement 14, prior to surgical intervention for stress urinary incontinence, cysto should be performed to assess for urethral and bladder pathology that may affect outcomes of surgery. Um, I will admittedly say that that has not always been the case, um, whether that is in training or as an attending. Um, and I always found it very interesting to kind of hear the different um, research studies and comments that they have. And in the guidelines, they do state that no evidence um, that there's no evidence that patients who undergo preoperative cysto have better outcomes for artificial urinary sphincter compared to those who do not. However, they really emphasize the reasoning behind it is really to look at urethral pathology, whether you have concern for stricture, um, bladder neck contracture, as well as bladder pathology. Um, so you want to see if there is any signs of maybe poor compliance or poor capacity noted. And this is the other aspect that um, I think is really important to assess here. Um, and I think another person mentioned that there's a rule out bladder tumors as well. So very important in some of our patients who've been radiated. So in a statement 15, clinicians may perform urodynamic testing in a patient prior to surgical intervention for stress incontinence in cases where it may facilitate the diagnosis or counseling. 
in our institution, we were trying to work on a possible protocol for artificial urinary sphincters. And this came up in question of when is it appropriate to use the urodynamics? Now, the urodynamics are not required before surgical intervention for incontinence after prostate treatment, unless the clinician is in doubt of the diagnosis or it is felt that patient counseling will be affected. So there is a study that was done by Lai et al. where um, they did urodynamic testing in evaluation of post-radical prostatectomy incontinence before they placed the AUS. And this was done in 129 patients looking at adverse features on the urodynamics, such as the presence of DO, early sensation of bladder filling, reduced systematic capacity, impaired, impaired compliance, and more. And one of the uh, findings that they had was the fact that the presence of adverse preoperative urodynamic features did not negatively affect the continence results after AUS implantation in patients with post-prostatectomy incontinence. However, one of the weaknesses that they would put, and I also put some of these references in the um, shared slides, which they will upload, is the fact that they did exclude patients who they had the most concern for um, in regards to failure. So that includes significant um, urge incontinence or refractory urge incontinence, along with patients who had um, very unsafe storage pressures. So, you know, they already excluded those who. Um, who may or may not, um, who may or may not uh, have had some failure. So it's really difficult to assess whether or not they would have been negatively impacted or not. So in going with treatment options, um, this is where they focus more on the surgical aspects. There's the sling that they talk about, the AUS, and this may be newer for some folks, which is the adjustable balloon devices, or we call it the PROACT device. Um, so the AUS should be considered for patients with bothersome stress urinary incontinence. Um, I would say it has become the gold standard in urinary incontinence. It came out in the 1970s and has been increasing in sort of uh, use and outcomes here. And the research has been um, really ripe for these guidelines to be produced. And in statement 19, the patient who selects the AUS, a single cuff perineal approach is preferred. So in the guidelines, they will specifically talk about um, the perineal approach versus the transcrotal approach, along with a tandem cuff versus a single cuff. One of the major, or I should say, um, overall summations that they've made is the fact that with a transperineal, or sorry, a tandem cuff, you're going to see a lot more revisions. And with a transcrotal cuff, you may see higher rates of um, incontinence. And that might be theorized secondary to the fact that it is in a more distal location than it would be in a perineal approach. So male sling should be considered as treatment options for mild to moderate stress incontinence after prostate treatment. So a lot of the limitations in assessing outcomes when it comes to sling studies is the fact that they often have insufficient follow-up. Their definitions of cure may vary. So common ones that we see are greater than 50% improvement, which can be very dependent on where they started. Also, um, they may say it is zero to one pad per day. In addition, they have deferring outcome measures, whether that's survey questionnaires or pad measurements. And so it's very difficult to combine all those studies. But generally, the cohort studies did not include patients with radiation, and they excluded patients with severe incontinence, hence why this guideline is in place. So last but not least on the polls, I was just interested in sort of understanding who is utilizing the PROACT balloon. So same way, it's with the QR code and the website. Please name your institution if you are offering adjustable balloon devices for mouth stress urinary incontinence. I will include University of Michigan as one. So this one, I'm not seeing the live answers. Oh, there we go. So yeah, University of Florida, go Gators. Um, Dr. Young is out there, and I know he most recently did a systematic review. Michigan sees that some of our residents are on. This is actually a test. 
for Shekel. So Europe has been ahead of the United States. Emery. I appreciate the Michigan residents that are on. I can see that it increases in volume as you guys are responding. Hadn't heard of it. Um, that's interesting. Okay. I appreciate that response. I also see a huh. I don't know if that's a university name or if they're just kind of shaking their head. And I appreciate the Go Blue. I apologize. Go Blue and Go Gators. I was planning on saying that at the very end. <laughs> Michigan is greater than Florida. <laughs> All right, all right, I'm gonna escape out of this. <laughs> it's gonna be a NCAA war. I miss sports. Okay, so going back to the PowerPoint slideshow. Statement 22, adjustable balloon devices may be offered to patients with mild stress urinary incontinence after prostate treatment. Um, this really came over to the United States, I wanna say in 2017 more officially. And it was in patients who have mild incontinence and no history of prior radiation treatment. Um, they do note in the guidelines that there is a higher intraoperative complication rate. One notably that they'll talk about is actually urethral and bladder perforation. However, in those cases, oftentimes they are just recited. And then the explantations may be higher. So for those who have not seen it, uh, this, let me see if my mouse is there. There we go. So on the bottom here are the two balloons. So this is the balloon tip. And this is where you actually um, insert the syringe to fill the balloon one milliliter at a time. And this trocar is how they place it while they're in lithotomy position. And this is all done fluoroscopically under fluoroscopic guidance, I should say, and also with cystoscopic direct visualization. And in a study that was done, this is in, I believe, 2008, 2007. It's a multi-center pilot study done in Europe. And they had uh, 62 patients who underwent prostate treatment. So that is majority prostatectomy patients, but also some bladder outlet procedures. And um, some patients did receive adjuvant radiation. I believe there was about 12 of them. And in those who uh, did not have adjuvant radiation, 59% were improved and 30% were cured. So you're looking at about 89% improvement. But in patients who had radiation, 83% failed the intervention. Um, and 19 patients overall required removal at the end. And, and during that study process, for those who are not aware of the ProX balloon, you can do balloon adjustments in clinic. And about 88% required balloon adjustments. And as I mentioned, during that sort of um, word cloud poll, there's an interesting systematic review that was done by Dr. Young at the University of Florida looking at the PROACT studies. And they did quote very similar concepts where with radiation, you are having higher complications. There are overall more complications than the artificial urinary sphincter. But the point that they do make is that this is a minimally invasive procedure the, some average times that they put out there is 30 minutes or less for the procedure itself. And this does not preclude you from other procedures in the future, such as an AUS. And going along, these are some of the more surgical options, um, whereas we're talking about stress urinary incontinence after treatment for benign prosthetic hyperplasia is really the same. There's not, um, as much data, I would say, in uh, treatment of incontinence after BPH procedures as there is with post-prostatectomy incontinence, but generally follows the same guidelines of the evaluation, workup, and treatment options. And in men with stress incontinence after primary adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy who want to have surgical management, the AUS is preferred over male slings or adjustable balloons. And that's really because of what has been reported um, out there in studies about patients with radiation and their complications, or even most of their studies have excluded those patients within their studies. So um, this is Harold again. He has the history of post prostatectomy incontinence that was treated with an AUS. He had a 4.5 centimeter cuff, a 61 to 70 centimeter pressure regulating balloon, and this was done about two years ago. And he returned stating that he was doing really well until three days ago when he abruptly started leaking 
just like before the surgery. So complications after surgery. In patients with persistent or recurrent urinary incontinence after an AUS or sling, clinicians should again perform the history physical exam and or other investigations to determine the cause of incontinence. This kind of goes back to my same point earlier where we're talking about how important the history and physical is in this setting and from a oral board setting as well. So patients should be counseled that the artificial urinary sphincter will likely lose effectiveness over time and reoperations are common. So this is a graph from a study by Lai et al. that really looked at um, the complication rates, which can be from infection, erosion, atrophy, the device itself or surgery. And they found that at about five years, 25% are requiring um, some sort of revision or surgery. And at 10 years, you're looking at 50%. So what can we um, sort of assess when it comes to persistent or new incontinence? We can talk about patient factors. So, you know, they talk about how you really need a patient to have cognitive ability to be able to utilize this, but um, even the best intentions may have an accidental deactivation. So that's something easily solved with re-education. They may not have inadequate cycling as well. Device factors that are involved are fluid loss, a fluid leak or an erosion. And when it comes to fluid loss or fluid leak, they talk about assessing this with cross-sectional imaging, whether that's a CT scan and or ultrasound to assess the fluid that's in the PRB. And that can also be done by just testing the pump as well. And iatrogenic, this is more so, I would say, in the immediate post-operative period where there might have been improper cuff sizing done on the surgeon's part, or there's improper cuff engagement of the tab that goes over that area. As for other reasons, we can talk about de novo urge incontinence, as well as um, one of the things that they, um, I think, have some controversy of whether or not it exists is a urethral atrophy, whether or not that is true. But there's a lot of studies that quote that urethral atrophy is one of the main reasons um, for the recurrent incontinence, especially later on down the road. This is more under special situations brought it in here because I think it's applicable to what complications may occur. So in a patient presenting with infection or erosion of an AUS or sling, explantation should be performed and reimplantation should be delayed. There's no set timing like within 24 hours or within 36 hours, but they say as soon as possible for the explantation of the artificial urinary sphincter. Now, they also talk about that some small repairs or small injuries, I should say, can be managed with an indwelling catheter for two to three weeks. Um, there have been also been studies that a urethroplasty at time of expectation can reduce the risk of strictures in the future. And when it comes to reimplantation, I think everyone has their sort of um, anecdotal evidence and anecdotal history behind when they end up doing it, but the guidelines talk about doing a reimplantation at about three or six months. They don't show really any significant differences in sort of the outcomes for the AUS in primary setting versus secondary setting, but that may not be within the cases of infection and erosion. And the guideline or the algorithms that I'm going to be showing here are also part of the guidelines. So we have talked about the artificial urinary sphincter failure, reasons for why they may fail, and the fact that you have a three to six month sort of time period before you are doing a replacement. If they have worsening incontinence without infection or er erosion, you may need to assess the volume status of the device. Um, generally, they do recommend that you replace the entire artificial urinary sphincter unless you can very specifically identify a defect and replace that specific part. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, whether or not you just need to downsize the cuff or move the cuff location. And it says add cuff here, but generally they are saying in the primary setting at least um, that you really want just single cuff because of the complications that can occur with a tandem cuff. Statement 29, in patients with persistent or recurrent stress urinary incontinence after sling, an artificial urinary sphincter is recommended. This is a study um, done by Ajay et al. that was looking at sort of the outcomes after a salvage AUS or after a salvage sling. And um, I think they were saying you can double cuff. I do not promote that, um, but that is something that I think people have discussed um, as for this salvage setting, um, you know, they, you can see here the salvage AUS is up here, and then the salvage sling is down here. 
and really the proportion of continent patients um, is much lower. So this goes along with the algorithm that's available on the um, actual guidelines themselves. So if there's an infection erosion, which I believe is really quite rare, I think you're looking at in the one to 2%, if at all, you can explain as much as possible and consider an AUS three to six months later. If they have really just inadequate continents, I um, usually place an AUS with or without a sling explant. I know in our institution, it's really without a sling explant. You just kind of go through the area and place the artificial urinary sphincter. Um, and they say replace the sling, but only by providers who are trained in replacement procedures. And I would also specify the fact that their outcomes may not be as good. So statement 30, in patients with persistent or recurrent stress urinary incontinence after an AUS, revision should be considered. I put this because I think they make important points of really trying to obtain the operative report. I know it's hard to um, hunt down any medical records, it's near impossible, uh, but it's very important to be able to determine the surgical approach, the cuff size that was already utilized and their PRB location when you have to remove all components and replace them. So this is really um, nearing the end and there's really one slide left for special situations. I've already brought one up earlier, but in statement 34, patients with stress urinary incontinence following urethral reconstructive surgery, they may be offered an AUS and should be counseled that complication rates are higher. I think this comes along with the fact that when you are doing certain urethroplasties, there may be a transection of the bulbar artery and that may diminish um, the blood supply to that area, which may portend higher risk to the patient. And in statement 36, patients with symptomatic um, bladder neck contractures should be treated prior to surgery for incontinence after pr prostate treatment. So they state that really you want to make sure that at least um, or uh, you're looking back into the bladder and that should be done really no earlier than four to six weeks after the procedure itself. So that was the end of the talk. Um, please feel free. I mean, we're going to do a Q&A session if there are questions that you'd rather ask personally. Um, that is my email that is available there. I will say um, I feel very humble to be giving this talk. There are folks at the respective involved institutions that are actually a part of this panel who did these guidelines. For instance, at our institution, John Stoffel has been um, a part of this guidelines panel. And I know at UCSF, we have Dr. Breyer. So um, I, if they are available or if they are on here, they can definitely weigh in. But I hope that everyone can be safe, happy, and healthy. And also, um, we will remind you, and I'll leave this up while we're doing the Q&A, but they would like us to fill out evaluations at the end of these lectures. And that evaluation is available at urologycovid.ucsf.edu. All right, so I think we have our resident, Yi Li, who has been um, combining all the questions, and so I'll sort of let him take the take the lead here now. Great, thanks, Dr. Yi, for an awesome talk, um, and thanks for everyone for participating in all your questions. I think you had a lot of positive uh, reviews for your polling, and people have said it was like being at an AUA talk, so that was great. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions flying in, which is awesome. I'll try to put them together. There are a lot of questions right now coming in about um, the transcorporeal cuff and um, sort of indications and issues regarding radiation and um, past urethroplasties and maybe elaborating a little bit on that. Yeah, so transcorporeal cuff, um, that one's a difficult situation, I think, because that has been very much from what I can see, a lot more anecdotal. So, um, you know, during training, we often use that because the utilization of a 3.5 centimeter cuff was something that was not looked highly upon. And so in patients that are radiated and or a repeat, oftentimes, and they were already at a four centimeter cuff and it was a lot smaller looking on um, surgery, uh, they would end up doing the transcorporal cuff. And for some people, three and a half centimeter cuff is not an issue, even in radiated patients, and that they would move forward instead with a three and a half centimeter cuff. The one thing that I would say is if they already have a penile prosthesis in place, uh, sometimes you may need to notify them that this may be something that might need to be removed depending on sort of the surgical 
um, skill set as well as sort of the concern for the devices themselves. So I always will um, guide the patients and counsel them that that might need to be removed at the time. So, yeah, I think you're muted currently. Oh, sorry. Follow, so follow up to that. Um, does the type of radiation treatment affect your surgical approach? So brachy versus external beam IMRT. So all of these um, guidelines, when they talk about radiation, I forgot to mention this, they're really focused on EBRT and brachytherapy. They weren't looking at some of the other focal therapies um, and other radiation treatments. So um, it would be really the same approach when it comes to EBRT and brachytherapy. Great. And then another question regarding uh, cuffs is, um, do you typically uh, utilize superfubic <laughs> tape after a uh, U.S. placement? Say that one more time. A, a super pubic tube after a U.S. explant or, or urethroplasty. So not always, but definitely can be utilized. I, I did a study looking at sort of concomitant urethroplasty at time of um, prosthetics, whether that's an IPP or an artificial urinary sphincter. This situation is pretty rare, I would say, so it doesn't happen all the time. The SV tube is nice because it's a backup. It's away from the urethra and provides bladder drainage and can be removed. Uh, but I think there isn't any right answer to that. It's just sort of what I've done through fellowship, and I can't say I have sort of the research background to say one way or the other from an outcome standpoint. Great. And then we'll switch gears here. Uh, a lot of questions coming in about the adjustable balloon. I think a lot of the residents hadn't heard about it. So if you could just elaborate on what it is, indications, et cetera. So, um, I also have not performed it. I think they've been trying to get me to do it at our institution. My partner, Bahama Life, does them. Um, and they're not really something that I think has been taken off right now at Michigan, but I know at the University of Florida they've done quite a bit. So really the indication is in post-prostatectomy patients, um, as well as post-prostate um, treatment patients that are not radiated with mild to moderate incontinence. They've also used it for severe incontinence. And everyone, I think I use these terms mild, moderate, and severe, and there isn't really quite a definition that everyone has utilized to define those categories. Um, but, you know, there are different grading systems like the MSIGS grading system for a standing cough test that try to, tries to define what is mild, moderate, and severe. Um, but when you look at the PRO Act specifically, they're really looking at mild to moderate for the best outcomes. And you are essentially in the lithotomy position and using sort of uh, contrast in the bladder as well as um, cystoscopic evaluation and um, sort of this marker of a trocar, you're really trying to identify a location through the perineum where you're right next to the bladder neck. And that balloon is sitting right at the bladder neck and it inflates in that area and provides compression just like a sphincter would. And what they do is they want to see some coaptation with the two balloons side by side. Um, and the idea is that if there isn't enough coaptation later on, you can always fill the balloon through an, um, really just kind of a skin poke with the needle and that sort of metal device at the end. And you can fill the balloon just a little bit at a time to provide additional compression. Um, the procedure itself, as I mentioned, is anywhere from 30 to 37 minutes. I think an initial study they looked at, even with new people, that was about average 37 minutes. And in clinic, you can do the refilling by palpating that metal area in the scrotal and perineal area and injecting it with solution. Um, I think the company itself has a lot of good videos out there that talk about it. Um, and I know they're always at AUA trying to set up the booth there, so you could always see some of their demonstrations as well. Great. Um, some questions are here about the use of the pad test. So when do you when do you initiate that test or what are your criteria and sort of what pushes you? What do you use in order to make your actual clinical decision? Yeah, so uh, whenever I do lectures with residents, it's sometimes I say, like, don't listen to me, listen to the guidelines, just because your clinical experience might be a little bit different. Um, I come from an institution where we didn't always do a pad test. We actually did a standing cough test in clinic, and this was graded by the M6 grading system with M6-1 being a um, mild incontinence and M6-4 being a 
severe incontinence, and that's MSIGS. And it's a standing cough test. We make sure that they have not urinated at least in the past hour, if not a few hours. And they perform four coughs, and we assess the outcome from that. Um, as for pad testing right now, I use that more in more, a history setting. So I ask about how many pads that they're using, how wet is it, and what type of pads are they using. Um, you know, I think a lot of guys in their 60s and 50s don't know the difference between a liner and a heavy pad, but I sort of try to talk to them about what are the differences in their pad usage and if they're using depends with it. Um, and that's sort of all part of my, um, my workup. As for sort of the other things that are included, sometimes I will obtain a PVR if I have very high suspicion that um, they are not emptying all the way. And the set amount for a post void residual to be normal is really unclear, but I set sort of an arbitrary um, goal of wanting them to be less than 150 to 200 um, based off of other guideline definitions. And as for um, you know, do we do a CISTO or not? I think I saw that question on one of the chats for the panelists, and I do not always do a cystoscopy. And there are some patients where um, they are refusing in clinic, if I had my suspicions of a bladder neck contracture, that they refuse to do it in clinic, and I will do it in the immediate um, first part of the case with the anticipation that if I do find a pathology, I will abort the procedure, and they are aware of that, and they are aware of those risks. Um, and, you know, is there a clear definition of when you have to do the CISO? That is also in question in sort of our institution for our protocol of whether or not this should be instituted um, as a policy that we're doing either in clinic or at the first part of the case. And I think we're in the midst of really discussing sort of the guidelines and the reasons for it and understanding why we're doing it. So I think we will be going towards doing more of a CISTO, but at this current time, I don't think that's a practice that everyone is doing. Super long answer, sorry. No, excellent. Please uh, go on as long as you like. Um, uh, questions about the use of clamps. So like Cunningham clamps in terms of workup, is that a good provocative device? Um, and how, you, how do you utilize that in your practice? Not sure what that means by provocative device, but um, I recommend it. Now, the fact that you're saying there's a clamp on the penis is really scary for most people. So um, <laughs> they are not for it, I would say. <clears throat> but um, the one thing is that I do tell them that there's a pad on it. There's different sizes. There's a pad. They, it's really, I think, best utilized in specific situations. So I found the best outcomes with patients who really are um, very into exercise and going to the gym. They find that in that one to two hours that they're going, that this has been really helpful. It's much better than wearing a pad at the gym or a condom catheter at that. And it provides them the ability to run comfortably um, and do any exercises that increases their abdominal pressure with ease. And I think it's a device that is used um, comfortably with other modalities. So I don't think it's a great, it may not be a great primary device, but it can be utilized with pads and or condom catheters. So I have a patient right now who they are you know, involved in board meetings and very worried about sort of appearances. And so they will oftentimes use um, a condom catheter so that they can go longer through these board meetings, as well as the Cunningham clamp on certain occasions. Excellent. Um, some questions about pelvic floor physical therapy. Do you recommend that to, you know, pre-prostatectomy uh, patients? When do you like to utilize a post-prostatectomy? And then do you use it all in terms of your assessment or initial treatment prior to AUS placement? So the guidelines, and I, I apologize, I did not include this part, but in the guidelines for the pretreatment, they do talk about um, the possible recommendation of pelvic floor muscle therapy before the procedure. I think it really helps in the standpoint of having that knowledge before the surgery, whether or not that truly affects their outcomes afterwards, I'm not sure. Um, there may be those who are smarter than me who know the answer to that, but, you know, I think it's really helpful to sort of get them started working on it because it is a process to do the muscle awareness as well as that sort of feedback and being aware of what muscles are involved. Um, and that's something that I think from an onco oncology standpoint, they really, really look into that and whether or not um, they need to do that. I actually don't see them in that setting. 
As for afterwards, um, being a part of a tertiary care center, I mainly see people who have really gone through all of the processes. So they've already done the pelvic floor physical therapy, whether it's the exercises or the training program, and they are really at their wit's end. I will say I'm not really seeing them you know, right at that year. Um, they've, there's been studies that show that people aren't really getting the, um, the care and sort of the surgery or recommendations that they need um, right away. So that guideline of having a year is interesting because sometimes I'm seeing people two years after things, three years after their procedure. So, um, you know, I'm seeing them after they've gone through a lot of pants and a lot of devices. Um, as for sort of counseling, you know, the occasional people that I see, um, you know, common question that they ask is, you know, they're at six months, will continued pelvic floor muscle exercise help? I do encourage them to continue to do it, especially in the meantime of waiting for booking for surgeries um, and sort of making that decision-making process that it likely will not hurt them overall. Um, but it is something that from my perspective, I don't see as much because I'm not seeing them right afterwards, uh, but I do encourage that if they haven't already. Great. Um, some questions about your specific choice of slings, as well as uh, your thoughts on the Adams uh, device and Adams versus Advance. Um, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what those are. Do you mind saying that first part again? Uh, which specific sling you like to use? Oh, okay. So um, one is I think I did put a little bit of a disclosure in the middle of or the end that I'm not the expert, um, but I will say I'm not familiar with the Adams device. I do use the um, I do use the Advanced sling. So now they have the Advanced XP. That is the most common sling that I utilize. I have also used the um, Coloplast sling as well. It has the forearms on the sling, um, and you know there's. I would say people have different reasons for why they're utilizing it, whether they're worried about retention rates or sort of, um, I know one instance, I was talking to a patient with mild incontinence who um, does have bladder cancer and requires frequent sort of interventions. And so we were talking about different options for slings. And there was a proposed theory that, um, you know, the forearm sling could be more beneficial as that would not cause that's a larger area of sling that would um, not as be much of an obstruction when people had to go back in to do either a biopsy or a resection. Whether or not that's true, I think is still sort of out there. We're not sure, um, but I do primarily use that advanced sling. Great. Um, questions about sort of the shared decision making. Uh, one question is how, can you elaborate on how you honestly address the quote, how many of these have you done question as a young attending? Yeah, so I do tell them that I underwent a fellowship that had a specific training for it. So I'm able to give them pretty high numbers. The other aspect is that I tell them that they should be at sort of a high volume center, which is where I am at, just because the staff themselves are very experienced at it. And the other thing that you can talk about is the fact that you should compare sort of what it is that a general urologist does as well as sort of someone who is specialized. So, um, you know, I did a fellowship at UT Southwestern for um, genital urinary reconstruction and trauma, which includes prosthetic urology. So I had quite a high volume of both IPPs, AUSs, and slings compared to sort of the general urologist, which may end up be doing one to five in a year. So uh, that is sort of the realistic aspect of it. They know that I'm not in practice for very long, but with the specialized training that I have, I've had quite a few accumulated over that time period. Um, and I also, you know, I have available at my sort of center, a lot of people who are experienced. So I believe there's about five of us that do IPPs and four or five of us that do artificial urinary sphincters um, and two of us that do the male sling. So there's quite a variety of expertise here. And if they ever wanted a second opinion, if they feel unsure, I'm happy to send them to my partners for that second opinion as well. And, you know, I think that in itself provides some confidence. And if you are able to tell them exactly, you know, without any hesitation where you stand, they have been very open um, and very understanding the situation and put full confidence in you. Great. And as a follow-up to that, do you have any thoughts on improving the setting of expectations for patients preoperatively and any gaps in communications you've witnessed between the reconstructive urologist and the on oncology? 
Well, that's a, that's a deeper question of which I, I may would have to think about if there's that gap between oncologists and the reconstructive urologists or prosthetic urologists. Um, I think we all have the same goal in mind, um, but I don't know if I see any outright gaps. And, and then the first question was again, sorry. Um, just improving the setting of expectations for these patients preoperatively. Yeah, so um, I know for me especially, I always try to tell the patients they don't feel forced to make a decision at that first appointment. Um, especially while I'm growing the practice, I'll oftentimes call them beforehand just to talk to them and see if they have any additional questions. What's also very beneficial is to provide them with resources. So um, I know one of our fellows, Julia Lane, is working on projects about decision aids, and I find them very helpful, whether that's pictures, pamphlets, websites. In addition, I use patient advocates, those patients who have undergone these um, devices or these procedures so they can help provide a sort of real life patient experience. In addition, other things that I offer for patients is that we do a patient seminar um, that is offered locally maybe once every three months or so. And we talk to the community more specifically and this gives them another chance to present with their partners and ask questions while hearing other people answer their questions about sort of, or people ask questions that they did not think about, and that will help them understand exactly, you know, what they may expect or what they didn't know they shouldn't expect. And everyone always tells me, I admit, I, I searched on Google, and, um, you know, I say that's not really a bad problem unless it's like pathologic to you, but, um, you know, I think that get, arms them with more information. So that's really been sort of how I set the expectations for my patients. Great. Um, we're circling back to some questions about bladder neck contracture. So um, what's your treatment preference for patients who have both bladder neck contracture and severe uh, stress urinary incontinence? And also, uh, sorry, do you, do you wait after treating a bladder neck contracture before inserting an AUS or something? How long do you wait? Okay, so easy question is yes, I do wait um, after treating a bladder neck contracture. I usually wait three months. Um, I know the guidelines say at least four to six weeks, I just wait three months. As for the, some of the recalcitrant um, bladder neck contractures, we have done deep incisions at the bladder neck, and that can be either cold knife or with a um, heated knife. And other things that we have utilized at our institution is the injection of mitomycin C to reduce the scar formation at the bladder neck. Um, and that's been sort of working for us. Um, we haven't really had too many issues. We do warn them that they may need another one, um, but really after that secondary one, they have had stability. And I will place a sphincter in those patients. Um, and you know they may or may not redevelop it, but I think within that first three months, if they are stable, we discussed that down the line, this may be an issue, but um, that it's stable at this time period and I would move forward. And uh, with regards to bladder cancer, for patients with uh, stress urinary incontinence or bladder cancer, do you wait until they're clear of a bladder cancer for a certain amount of time prior to any surgical approach? So I've always found that to be a very tough question, and that might be something that I would want to defer to some of the experts because I've also had some difficulties, I admit, in sort of that process. I usually involve the oncologist early on just to see sort of what that entails. Um, and I believe, I think we're gonna be cutting soon, but um, the, I do talk with the oncologist first and I discuss sort of what sort of bladder cancer that they have. You know, it, Dr. Pruthi mentioned, you gotta, um, you gotta divide them by low risk to intermediate and high risk. And I think that's important sort of their counseling because their treatment may change very drastically in the coming months or years. And then you have to take into consideration how many cystos that they will have in the future, as well as will they need intervention like biopsies or resections in the future. And oftentimes I will wait when we have some stability in that. So, you know, maybe in a low grade patient that for nine years they've been okay, then yeah, sure, I'll move forward with them. But when it comes to um, somebody who's diagnosed with high grade T1, who knows where they will end up. So I think it would be important to wait. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yi. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us and for all your questions. Please remember to fill out the evaluation form for us on the website to help us uh, continue to improve this uh, series. And we will take all the unanswered questions and send them to Dr. Yi and try to get them posted on the website for you guys as well.